Uh, I guess the message today is actually pretty simple. Uh, in my opinion, February and March was a once in a lifetime opportunity to move out of term deposits into debt instruments and for those with the appropriate time horizon straight into equities. Now clearly this was the opposite of what was actually occurring. Uh, and despite the price action of a number of businesses suggesting that we were near the end of the panic liquidation that we were seeing in financial markets, fear, and in particular fear on the banking system, was driving record inflows into cash at record low yields. And this was in contrast to historic low valuation metrics on equities and record high credit spreads uh, on debt instruments. And if we just have a look at this slide, this is a slide that's probably the most important slide to, to show to your clients. And it basically highlights that you always get record inflows just before the top in the market, and you get record outflows just before the bottom of the market. It's also the, the reason for the extreme volatility that we get just before inflection points, because as you can see, the herd is always at its maximum side, size just before that inflection point, and they are always, in the short term, stampeding in the wrong direction. Now the drive to cash has been astounding and early March was a lonely place to be in the equity market if you were trying to hold your conviction. The market was calling every investor's bluff and was driving record cash levels. And again we can see here cash levels compared to the S&P equity market and you can see recently all time record level of cash. Now the drive to cash has not only been amongst investors but also corporations. Investment banks are having a field day selling the easiest game in town. Raise equity, reduce your debt. And CEOs, being like investors, feel much safer in the crowd and are blindly following the music, much like the children followed the Pied Piper. The irony of the fact that two to three years ago they were all clamouring to increase their leverage appears to have been lost. And the title of a recent presentation by ING at the Insurance and Bank CEO conference in London that I recently attended pretty much sums it up. Reducing risk and leverage. It was a common theme throughout all the presentations and it was a, it was a reflection of just how reactive most CEOs are. The further the market declined, the more they became convinced that they had to prepare for the very worst. And as a result, they've been liquidating assets at what I suspect will be fire sale prices. They've certainly protected themselves from the threat of Armageddon, but as the, bank, uh, as the CEO of Lloyds Bank admitted, he's probably raised too much equity. But they all think they're doing the right thing because the environment has supposedly changed. Now, the environment has changed, but they're only partially correct because what they forget is asset prices have also changed. And so I suspect that they are just compounding their previous mistakes by becoming too risk averse just at the point where risk-adjusted returns are exploding. Now, the conviction in cash has also been expressed in a lot of questions that we've been receiving about our 110% invested position. And people asking, why don't you have significant levels of cash given the lack of visibility in markets? It appears that lack of visibility has become the catchphrase or the, the favourite phrase of the month. A couple of interesting points. The best investment opportunities will always occur when visibility is at its worst. When everything's clear, it's unlikely you're going to find undervalued opportunities. Visibility can also depend on your time horizon. If you actually step back from the noise of the market today, I suspect you'll make a number of observations that are actually clearly visible. First, many businesses are selling at record valuation lows and we're seeing record selling of shares. Second, cash reserves of investors and corporations are at record levels, when yields are at record lows. We're also witnessing the greatest uh, global coordinated stimulus of economies, from fiscal stimulus and low interest rates. And I suspect that's going to be more favourable for equities rather than cash. And also have a think about this. Government bonds, I suspect, are in just a bigger bubble as the TMT bubble that we saw in 2000 and the housing bubble that we saw in 2006. The Australian government, for example, has embarked on a record spending spree and as a result, borrowing binge. They've guaranteed bank deposits, they've guaranteed bank wholesale uh, lending, 
and they've also been forced to guarantee the state governments. If the Australian government was a corporation, I suspect the increased leverage that they've embarked on would see them downgraded to junk status. In contrast, corporations are being forced to raise equity and reduce their debt. So in theory, their credit ratings are improving. And yet the spread between industrial debt and government bonds has never been higher. The market's got it around the wrong way. If you have a look at this chart, uh, it takes credit spreads all the way back to the Great Depression, and they actually exceeded what was seen in the Great Depression. So I suspect that expectation will prove to be wrong. And for advisors, the yield curve opportunity in terms of what you can invest in, uh, in the yield segment, should have you salivating. You've never had a better opportunity to give your client a spread above cash after all fees, manager fees, advisor fees, etc., and still give them record high spreads above the cash or the, re or the reserve bank rate of return. And to try and highlight just how dysfunctional markets have become and how they were driven by psychology, I've got a couple of anomalies up here that I want to highlight. The first one is the government debt versus government guaranteed debt. If we go back to the, uh, to the table, you'll see the term deposits have been yielding approximately 2.9%. Everyone's clamouring to term deposits because they're gar gar guaranteed by the government. Well, so are government bonds, and so are government guaranteed bank debt. Yet you can get an extra 80 to 150 basis points on government guaranteed bank debt. It's a no-brainer to go from term deposits at least to the government guaranteed bank debt. And also have a think of the fact that if the government's guaranteeing the, the, the uh, ability for banks to issue debt, they're clearly wanting the big four to survive. And in that case, the non-guaranteed debt is probably pretty safe as well. In fact, I would argue there's no difference between the guaranteed and the non-guaranteed. And again, you can pick up an extra 50 basis points. The second anomaly is that subordinated debt of banks, which has a higher credit rating than hybrids, is actually selling on a higher yield. We can see here that non-government guaranteed subordinated debt is yielding 8% plus, and we have some deals that are yielding up to 20% on a quarter maturity basis. Again, it's anomaly caused by illiquidity in the markets and psychology. And the final anomaly, onshore versus offshore. And what I mean by that is that we recently picked up um, a piece of paper in Australia, Morgan Stanley debt. Uh, in the days when debt was easy to issue, a lot of the offshore corporations were issuing in Australia, uh, 25, 50 basis points over the, the uh, benchmark rates. Morgan Stanley was one such issuer. Well, we were recently able to pick up one of their issues, it's about two to three year paper, at 800 basis points over the bank bill rate. And to be honest, you kept looking and thought, we've, we've got to be missing something here. And that was a point of time where Morgan Stanley, the share price had doubled, reflective of the fact that the US government was effectively guaranteeing them now. And so it appeared that the worst was passed in terms of the banking crisis, and yet it still sold at 800 basis points over. When we rang up London to check what US dollar Morgan Stanley debt was trading for in London, the answer came back 400 basis points over. The same paper in London was 400 that was selling in Australia for 800. And the reason was very simple. All the offshore investors have disappeared from our markets. If you want to sell in this market, there's no buyers, and that's the price. So there's some extraordinary opportunities and basically arbitrage opportunities purely from the illiquidity uh, in the markets. Now to also um, show you how psychology can impact markets and, and why it's so important in, in what you're dealing with today, I always like to throw out the general growth uh, uh, property example. And I don't actually like to throw it up because every time I see it, it makes me cry. Um, Back in 2005, 2006, we identified that the property trusts that were highly geared were in all likelihood, a number of them were going to go bankrupt. And it was very simple. The return to the owner of these businesses was about 4 or 5%, and yet their borrowing costs were pretty much similar. In other words, at any point in the future, if borrowing costs went up, these companies were in all likelihood go bankrupt. So I think we shorted this stock around about the $40 mark and watched it up over the next six to nine months go up 50% and it was very, very painful. Kept scratching our heads, couldn't work it out. Anyway, it soon uh, declined about uh, 30 or 40% back to where we bought it uh, in very quick time, at which point we decided to close out our short, 
partly because it had happened very, very quickly, uh, but I suspect in hindsight partly because the psychology of the markets had worn us out of the position. Two weeks ago it filed for bankruptcy. We were 100% correct, but we just didn't have the patience or the will to hold our conviction when the market was moving against us short term. And another interesting one is HSBC, once considered to be one of the safest big banks uh, in the globe. Well, on March the 9th of this year, one of the experienced cable TV uh, commentators was brought to tears because as she was presenting, she noticed the ticker on HSBC, uh, which had already declined from 140 to 40 over a six-month period. She noticed the ticker price clicked down to $33. And on TV, she burst into tears. Now, it was pretty tough in March, I can tell you, and, and I know exactly how she felt. But I think it's often good to remember that it's always darkest before dawn. Because March the 9th turned out to be the very low in bank stock prices. Just when people become most convinced of what is going to happen, typically markets go the other way. And since then, we have HSBC, uh, Wells Fargo in the US, KBC in Europe, and Lloyds uh, in the UK. And those stocks over a two or three month period have increased from anywhere from two to four times. It just shows you how quickly markets can turn when, the mar when investors believe the worst. Likewise, uh, our own global fund, since the March 6 lows, has increased by 50% plus in very quick time. If we had have moved to cash because of the lack of visibility, that rebound would obviously have been severely diluted. Now, to also highlight the compelling opportunities that did make themselves present um, in the equity markets, we're just highlighting a few examples here. And one of the interesting areas uh, that we've started to venture back into is commodities. Now, everyone knows the commodity story, everyone knows the China story. Uh, and clearly, people got too excited about it. And when the global go world goes into the threat of a deep recession, commodity stocks are going to be hit. But when the economy is at its darkest point, that's the ideal time to buy quality resource companies. And China's Chuenhua is the world's second largest produ producer of thermal coal. But importantly, it's a very low cost producer, has minimal debt on its uh, balance sheet, and we all know that the Chinese are going to continue to demand thermal coal for their power industry. With the 70% decline in the stock price, uh, we were afforded that company at about eight to nine times earnings, which again for a debt-free balance sheet, low-cost producer was pretty compelling. And they're the sort of opportunities that are available in the marketplace today. Likewise, Gazprom in Russia. Uh, we had an extra opportunity here because not only was Gazprom reacting to the commodity issues and the threat of a global recession, but issues, uh, political issues surrounding Russia saw the collapse of the ruble uh, and investors were, were uh, stampeding out of anything Russian. Stock price collapsed 80%. But the thing about Gazprom is it's got one of the best energy reserve bases that you'll ever want to find. Long life, low cost, and it supplies 30% of, Europe, of European gas needs. It's hard to think of a more strategic asset that you would want to own. Again, down 80%, we're actually able to buy this company on three times earnings. Now, obviously very volatile in the short term, uh, but I suspect over another three to five years, even though it's doubled from the bottom, it could easily double and triple again. And they're the sort of opportunities that are present themselves for the next three to five years. Uh, the next one, not so volatile, but a great company, Google. Everyone knows Google. Uh, we all know it as the dominant business model in the new media. Uh, we all know that uh, online is structurally growing, and this company has 50% operating margins, spews out cash, and net cash on the balance sheet. Wonderful business. You don't often get the, uh, the opportunity to buy it. But again, in this market, down 60%. Yes, lack of visibility short term, but at 15 times earnings for this business. Pretty interesting. And then the final example, uh, Sotheby's. Uh, you'll all know uh, Sotheby's, a duopoly in the art auction market, uh, down 90%. Hard to believe. Obviously, the art market collapsed. Uh, people were concerned that they'd take losses on art. Uh, their commission revenue would drive up. Um, but the interesting thing about Sotheby's down 90%, it was it's selling at about eight to nine dollars. Well, if you take the value of their New York headquarters building, you also take the value of the artwork on the balance sheet 
which was now valued at very distressed distress prices. And the only other asset they own are the loans uh, to their uh, art clients, which is again backed by art now at very distressed prices. The book value of the company was about eight to nine dollars. In other words, you could buy the building in New York, the artwork at very distressed prices, and you were getting the auction business for free. Very interesting. So again, eight to nine dollars. I think in the short term it got down to six dollars fifty. Uh, it's back now to twelve dollars. I'm sure it'll jump around in the short term, but over three to five years, I suspect at some point it has the opportunity to double or triple. So again, depending on the outlook for the economy, there are some extraordinary opportunities uh, in the equity market. What about banks? Um, look, we could talk all day about banks. Uh, it's been the favourite topic on the back page or front page of the paper every day for the last six to 12 months. So I really don't want to go and repeat it. In hindsight, uh, it's pretty clear that the regulators and the government have made some serious mistakes. They've made the situation a lot worse. They unfortunately made the banks uh, take on way too much capital at the very point they should have been easing them through the crisis uh, and letting, letting them get through with minimum capital levels. But I think they've finally worked it out. Uh, the end result, though, is that in the UK, shareholders have been severely diluted. Uh, in the US, funnily enough, because that's where the problem started, they've been the less uh, diluted. And the price movements that I showed up on the earlier charts, I think, highlights that the worst is passed in terms of the banking industry. And the interesting thing is that the earnings power of many of these banks is undiminished. Uh, Wells Fargo is a classic example. $5 earnings power when we get through um, what we're going through in the next few years. Stock got down to $10, or two times their recovery earnings. Stock's now at about $25, which is five times. But I suspect at some point in the next two to three years, it'll be back to 10 to 12 times. And if you think about it, in the post-crisis world, you're going to have less competition for financial services, uh, more capital on the balance sheets of these banks, uh, and as a result, they're probably going to sell at higher valuations. So again, if it sells at 10 to 12 times, which is well below its historical range, you're still talking up 100, 150%. So interesting opportunities in, in banking. And if you really want to understand the way we think about banks uh, and our current thought process on Wells Fargo and other banks, in the presentation that will be put on the website um, following uh, the conference today, we've put an appendix which is a uh, Q&A with Warren Buffett uh, in relation to Wells Fargo, and I'd encourage you to read that. It's about six pages, but it's very insightful and it pretty much sums up exactly what our attitude towards banks is uh, today and in the future. So I guess um, the issue you know, with the sharp rebound in the market over the last couple of months is, is this uh, a bear market rally. Now, only time will tell. Much is going to depend on the recovery uh, in the economy and its sustainability over time. And there's no doubt that we're in for difficult uh, times ahead. You know, the governments have made a lot of mistakes. Um, all this spending that they've you know, engaged in recently, particularly in Australia, we're going to have to pay for it some, at some point of time. Uh, and as a result, we are going to have sluggish growth for a, an extended period. But that's actually a good thing. We need to repair balance sheets. And it's a great thing for investing because it means risk-adjusted returns will stay at reasonably elevated levels, which if you're investing new capital is exactly what you want to happen. And coming back from London, my initial thoughts uh, on the economy was that the financial world or the financial community has pretty much extrapolated their own paranoia about their own personal situation onto their expected behaviour of the consumer. Uh, and I suspect that's going to turn out to be wrong. I think we'll see increasing signs that the, the consumer is still breathing uh, and as a result the, the economy won't turn out to be as dire as that we were all thinking uh, a couple of months ago. But the important issue for financial markets is what's been discounted in asset prices. And clearly we had a worst case scenario discounted in asset prices. It may feel safe to be hiding in term deposits, but I suspect that's not going to be a wise thing to do. So in conclusion, before we open it up for questions, uh, safety in numbers doesn't work in the investment world. Uh, the investment world has gone from underpricing risk to overpricing it. Yield securities in February, I believe, was a once in a lifetime opportunity, and equities likewise were compelling. 
When everyone believes that cash is king, it's likely that cash is trash. <laughs>